Hello, this is Irina again, historian and teacher, and a warm welcome back to my channel on history and language, mostly Nordic and German. In a previous video, I talked about the importance of cats in the Viking Age. If you want to check that out, there is a link in the card above as well as in the description. So I thought it may be interesting to do a follow up with dogs this time. I will be referring mostly to literary post-Viking sources, so there is a clear limitation to the material, but that doesn't mean it should be dismissed. Without it, a lot of things would be in the dark, but, you know, just proceed with caution. Alright, let's see how dogs are portrayed in Old Norse. In the medieval Icelandic sagas, dogs are depicted mostly as pets. Well, pets in the sense of domesticated animals for purposes beyond eating their meat, and relationships are developed with them. As human companions in saga literature and through their communication and intelligence, loyalty and emotional bonds with people, these pets inhabit a liminal space between animal and human. Much like pets nowadays, if you think about it, where, because a pet is never just an animal hanging around your house. Ever since their domestication 13,000 years ago, dogs are highly ambiguous creatures, a kind of potential mediator between the two worlds of humans and animals, as they embody some qualities most valued in human society. Dogs also served a variety of utilitarian functions in medieval Scandinavia between, uh, beyond companionship, including herding sheep and cattle, hunting on the mainland and guardianship of the home. Both horses and dogs served important practical purposes, people developed intimate relationships with them as well, which is why they figure so prominently in the sagas with their human companions left mourning once they are gone. In the Norwegian law, Frostothingslog, um, we find some insight into how different breeds of dogs were conceived and valued. A hierarchy can be formed according to how much you had to pay if you killed the dog. You had to pay 12 euro, that would be something like a penny, for the lap dog, the Kovanraki. You had to pay 6 euro for the Mjokunder, that would be the greyhound, 4 uh, euro for the Veidihunder, that would be the hunting hound, and for the Nautahunder, that would be the cattle dog, um, you had to pay for as well, and only one euro for the house dog, which was presumably kept for guardianship. So most bewildering here is the high value placed on lap dogs, so the small ones, which provided no important functions such as hunting, herding or guardianship. Rather, these animals demonstrated social status and conveyed privilege. No such dogs, lap dogs, are mentioned in native medieval Icelandic literature, by the way, but they are found in translated continental romances. Most notable is the beloved and highly fantastical canine in Tristram Saga of Isandar, so a version of the Tristan and Isolde legend. <clears throat> in medieval Iceland, the best hero dogs are the large ones, who are also brave and loyal, herding sheep, barking when enemies approach the home and fiercely attacking their master's opponents. Let's look at a couple of examples. So first of all, we have Sommer in Njol Saga. He is large and no worse a companion than a valiant man, the saga tells us. The description goes on to say that he has the wits of a man, he will bark at any man that he knows to be your enemy, but never at your friends. He also sees in every man whether he intends good or evil for you. He will also lay down his life to be true to you. Somar is introduced like a human hero, in other words. His devotion to the hero Gunnar is proven later in the saga. Intending to kill Gunnar, his enemy Morð warns a group of 40 attackers that they must first eliminate his dog. The farmer Thorkel went to the house and the dog lay up on the roof. He lured the dog away with him into some runnels, but when the dog saw that there are men nearby, he jumped onto Thorkel and bit him in the groin. Um, at this point, Onundr, another enemy, struck the dog in the head with his axe uh, so that it went right into the brain. The dog howled loudly um, so that they thought they had never heard uh, such a thing before, and then he fell down dead. So Sommer detects the stranger's intentions and realizes quickly that they plan to harm his master Gunnar. Then we have Snati in Bordar Saga, Snefelsos, uh, who appears to be 
perhaps the most exceptional canine to be found in any of the sagas of the Icelanders. Even more than Sommer mentioned before, this pet of Gester is portrayed with unusual quasi-human characteristics. When leaving the cave of a troll woman, so some kind of a witch, by the name of Heater, um, Gester, the character, is given a very large grey dog named Snati. He was better in fight than four brave men, the saga tells us. He proves his attributes when the monstrous trolls Kolbjörn and his mother Skruka come to a valley to kill. He demonstrates his wisdom when he understands Gester's instructions to go against the ugly troll woman. He climbs up a crag and rolls large stones down onto Skruka and when she throws them back, Snati kills the crone by rolling a boulder which lands on her back. So not only does Snati prove that he can understand complex human language, he also establishes his ability in battle. He appears in two more episodes on an island off the coast of Greenland when um, Gester descends into the mound of King Ragnar on a rope that is held by a priest and many other men. He experiences terrifying wonders um, within um, um, and then all the men holding the rope um, get scared and flee except for the priest and his dog Snati. On their return voyage, Gester needs to know the location of a reef and requires Snati's aid. He sends Snati out into the waves and the dog immediately uh, leaps out into the surf and dives underwater uh, there where the reef was expected. Then Snati uncannily realizes that Gester needs to know the exact location of this reef and he sacrifices his life for his master. Uh, tragically, Ragnar's magical powers are still at play and Snati drowns in the waves. So Snati is pretty much supernatural and he is after all a gift from a witch. Um, but at the same time, it is hard to say whether this kind of exceptional intelligence and wisdom in a canine were seen as um, something usual or so the norm in Icelandic uh, medieval society. A third example would be the dog of uh, Olavur Tryggvason. He is given this pet dog named Vigi as a gift while raiding in Ireland. Vigi demonstrates two of the most important utilitarian functions served by dogs in medieval Scandinavia, which are herding and hunting. When some of Olaf's men drive a large number of sheep and cattle towards the shore, a farmer asks Olaf to return his cattle. He agrees, but only if the farmer can recognize the animals that belong to him. The farmer then points at his large Hjarthundr, so the shepherd's dog, um, into the herd of cattle and the dog proves his intellectual capacity by running around the whole herd but only driving those cattle that belong to the farmer. The farmer then gives Olaf the dog, describing him simply as the best of all dogs. The name Viggy is also significant because it translates as a fighter. Viggy appears during uh, Olaf's victorious sea battle against Rauder in Rami, Rauder the Strong, and Thorir Hjortr, uh, Thorir Hart, um, the young um, stag, so this is also a name of significance. Um, Thorir Hjortr flees on land and then Olaf takes up the chase, he is followed by his dog Viggy and then the king delivers his uh, pun, uh, Viggy take uh, or get get the heart, so get the stag. As a further sign of his training, Vigi understands Olaf's language and runs not after a stag, but after Thorir and jumps on him. So um, he is forced to stop afterwards, allowing his master to kill him with a spear, and then Vigi is born wounded to the ship. He also proves himself to be capable of hunting uh, as well as herding, evidenced by Thoris' epithet. Um, so he's shown to help hunt people, but the pun suggests that he is also very good at hunting animals as well. So, remarkable loyalty in the face of danger. Furthermore, we have another saga, Oder Snorason's saga Olaf Strigvasonar, um, where a retainer informs Vigi of the death of their lord, and in a supernatural twist, Vigi clearly comprehends um, the 
import of human speech rather than simply obeying instructions. Uh, he begins to howl loudly, climbs upon the king's burial mound and lies uh, down. He dies with his master like the companion animals who are buried with people for their journeys in the afterlife. The qualities of pet dogs are similar to those of the people that they follow. Um, this reminds us of the so-called animal filgur, which metaphorically reflect a person's um, uh, characteristics. The filgia was a part of the soul in pre-Christian Old Norse religion. If you want to know more about that, I also made uh, a video on this topic. And speaking of Filgia, Somer's death, so the first dog I mentioned, is not only plot determined but also has an important symbolic dimension. Uh, Gunnar is sleeping when this happens but he knows right away after waking up that the dog is dead. There is no textual signal that Gunnar is dreaming but this episode evokes a parallel to the uh, Filgur um, which can be transla translated as fetches. Um, which appear to individuals in dreams and are indicative of a person's character and fate. The death of someone's filigia indicates the death of the person the animal follows and Gunnar knows this himself because after expressing his sorrow, he states that little time will pass between um, his death and the death of his dog. The verb filgia to follow is used more than once to describe this uh, kind of relationship, uh, explicitly linking the two concepts of human-animal companionship. The same goes for the other dogs in the sagas, by the way. So the link is metonymical rather than metaphorical, as with the dream animals. These dogs are all valiant dogs who belong to characters that are noble and heroic. This is also true of the dogs in the um, sagas of the ancient times, the von Altrasögur. So in the saga of Hrolf Kraki, for example, you have King Hrolf or Hrolver, who has a large dog named Grammar, the adjective Grammar meaning wrath, but the word is also used in poetry uh, to designate a king or a warrior. While staying with a treacherous king named uh, Adils in Sweden, King Rolf and his men are awakened from their sleep by a loud noise. Adils has sent his sacrificial um, magic boar to attack them, whereas the boar is the companion of Adils, who is associated with magic and evil, uh, Hrolf's animal is a heroic dog. The Viking Bodbar Bjarki sends the dog onto the boar by shouting. Grammar understands the instructions and proves his bravery by attacking the fearsome beast without hesitation. Although Bodvar is a mighty warrior, he is unable himself to pierce the boar's back and it is Grammar who defeats the monster. There is a very different type of dog also named Grammar in uh, Thorstein Staga Viking Sonar. His loyalty is this time not to a noble, noble king or hero, but to an evil man who is the enemy of one of the saga's protagonists, a robber named um, Fulavli. Grammar fights with supernatural ability and um, Thorir, one of the brothers of the saga, is uh, unable to wound the dog until he bites a chunk uh, of, um, of Thorir's calf, after which um, he is able to pin the dog against the ground and, uh, and kill him. Um, so Grammar fights one of the brother of the story, uh, the brothers of the story with supernatural ability and Thorir is unable to wound the dog until he bites him, after which uh, he is able to, to do that. So this might also involve some kind of uh, metaphorical uh, meaning because, you know, Thorir is supposed to be um, the representative of the good. Noteworthy is also the presence of the myth mythological hellhound uh, Garm in Old Norse myth. He is the one who will be fighting uh, Tyr at the Ragnarok and whether he is the same as the wolf Fenrir is a little bit unclear. Another important utilitarian function served by dogs in medieval Scandinavia was that of guardianship. For example, Islandica Saga depicts a guard dog where um, Haver, the steward, is depicted with having um, a good dog and he always um, lay in front of the bed and then one night the dog disappears, is never found again, um, the next night Haver is killed. 
The event is seemingly planned and the dog purposely disposed of first because barking as a means of communication may interfere with the plans of um, Havers attackers. This uh, metonymic connection between dog and owner in saga literature is paralleled by the legal consequences faced by people for the deeds of their own animals. So according to the Icelandic law code um, Grogos, the grey goose, a dog's owner is legally responsible for the actions of his animal. If a dog bites into the bone or a tendon or cartilage, then the penalty would be lesser outlawry, for example, for the dog's owner. Uh, and the penalty is full outlawry if the injuries are considered to be major wounds or if the result is death. Many dog remains have been found in Scandinavian burial sites. Half of the Viking Age graves at Valsierde, for example, in Sweden, contain uh, positively identifiable dog remains for a minimum of total for a minimum total of 20 dogs. Uh, the graves of the pre-Viking period, the so-called Vendel period, are characterized by a greater variability and a preference for multiple dogs per uh, burial, while in the Viking Age the clear standard was only a single dog, um, generally speaking a preference for large ones. The vast majority of these dogs appear to have been buried intact, conforming to the standard of late Iron Age Swedish burials. The size and type results are strongly reminiscent of those from the nearby cemetery of Vendel, compounding the numerous archaeological parallels between the two sites and strengthen it, strengthening the hypothesis of a shared elite funerary culture between uh, the two sites. So basically you have um, important chieftains um, and uh, their dogs as well. The full meaning of the dog's presence in these graves is, however, impossible to reconstruct, but it is almost certain that they had a combination of practical, uh, social, cultural and personal dimensions. A generalization on this topic is not that wise, but at the very least it appears that most dogs were intended to accompany their master in the afterlife as they had in their earthly life. The social and sacrificial role is also depicted sometimes in great detail on rock carvings which show hunting scenes and also ritual ceremonies. According to historian Adam of Bremen, writing in the 11th century, dogs were among the sacrifices at the Temple of Uppsala in Sweden, dedicated to Odin, Thor and Freud. Dog skeletons, sometimes several at the time, are found along with those of horses and cattle in the great Scandinavian ship burials of the Viking Age and both large hunting dogs and small breeds in individual graves are present. Dogs were imported to Iceland as evidenced by excavations of graves which contain full skeletons of dogs and again they were buried with both um, they were buried with their masters. A couple of examples of uh, dog breeds, so hunting dog breeds, we have for example the Norwegian elk hound, the Swedish elk hound, the Danish bird dog or the Karelian bear dog and herd dog breeds included the lap reindeer dog, the Icelandic sheep dog, um, the valhund and so on. These dogs were highly valued and expensive to train and keep, so they became symbols of status among the Norse. The importance of the dog also indicates the potential inclusion of dogs in Odin's Great Hall of Valhall in the afterlife. If we take a look at um, the runestone, um, the Schenkvidenstien from the island of Gotland, which depicts a fallen warrior arriving into the afterlife, we can see a Valkyria coming um, towards him with a cup of milk mead with what seems to be the warrior's dog waiting for him behind the Valkyria. And no, there was no such thing as a dog's heaven, so sorry about that. Okay, so I do hope you enjoyed the talk and uh, found out some interesting stuff. If so, subscribe for more similar content, give me a hand with the channel and help it grow because I want to share much more with you. If you know about dogs and their use or symbolism in other cultures and traditions, comments are most welcome. Thank you very much for listening and till next time.